This is Craig Applegath, and this is the 21st Century Imperative Podcast, the podcast series that explores the insights and approaches of scientists, designers, planners, engineers, business entrepreneurs, and other successful change makers who are finding effective ways to meet the three critical challenges posed by the 21st Century Imperative. These are how will we continue to live on our planet without destroying our biosphere? How will we repair and regenerate the environmental damage we have already caused? and how will we adapt to the escalating impacts of climate change. Each episode will feature an interview with an individual whom I think you will find not only inspiring, but also very relevant to helping you answer the question, what can I do to meet the challenges of the 21st century imperative? In this podcast episode, in place of our typical interview format, you will hear the keynote presentation I gave to the American Institute of Architects Students Conference in December 2019. This presentation sums up the key ideas that I've been exploring with our podcast guests over the past two years, as well as the background research for those interviews. For all of you who have been following the science of climate change, you will know that 2020 is the beginning of no ordinary decade. The coming decade will most probably be the last opportunity our species has to pull back from the brink of climate change catastrophe and hopefully save ourselves and the rest of the biosphere from runaway global warming. As I record this introduction, the continent of Australia is on fire and it's estimated that more than a million animals have been killed and the fires rage on. But as I make clear in this podcast, the good news is that we now have all the tools and technologies to stop global carbon emissions if we decide to do it. And we've done something of this scale before. We did it in the Second World War, starting in 1940, where in two years, under President Franklin D. Roosevelt, the United States instituted their arsenal of democracy program and went from producing no planes, no tanks, and no arms to producing hundreds of thousands of them to supply to all the allies in their fight against Nazi Germany and then Imperial Japan. However, to deal with climate change and set up planes, tanks, and guns, we will need to build millions of photovoltaic panels, thousands of wind generators, and plant billions of trees. I've come away from the last two years of producing this podcast very much inspired by the hugely valuable contributions that my guests have been making to help us address the challenges of the 21st century imperative. But at the same time, I have a mounting sense of concern at how slowly our species is coming to grips with the terrible reality that now faces us. It is no exaggeration to say we now need to be making serious preparations for all hands on deck, heroic last ditch effort to save ourselves and the biosphere as we now know it from global warming catastrophe. From what we are hearing from the most knowledgeable and expert climate scientists, we have 10 years and possibly less depending on how quickly the global warming positive feedback loops accelerate the warming process to stop emitting CO2 into our atmosphere and to find ways to reduce existing atmosphere concentration of CO2. In this keynote presentation, I lay out how we can most effectively do this, and I introduce what I've called the Architects New Deal. New Deal being an acronym for the seven key things that I think architects, engineers, landscape architects, and planners can do to make a significant contribution to this effort. The clock is now ticking. Our future hangs in the balance. It's time for us to get serious. Let's make this year count. I have the distinct honor of getting to introduce tonight's keynote sponsor. And so please join me in welcoming Michelle Reinhardt from Tau Sigma Delta to the stage. Thank you. Um, I'm delighted to be here with you tonight. For many of you, this is going to be a transformational conference and experience. And my hope is that you take that back to your schools and be advocates for change and growth, not only in your educational experience, but also as the, the future of our profession. At Georgia Tech, I actually have the honor of serving as the faculty advisor to Tech's chapter of AIAS, as well as being the chapter advisor to Tau Sigma Delta. And this year, I began my term as the president of the grand chapter of Tau Sigma Delta. Tau Sigma Delta is honored to recognize tonight's keynote speaker, Craig Apogap, with the Tau Sigma Delta Silver Medal and honorary membership in the Honor Society. I want to take a few moments to introduce him. I know I'm standing between you and a great lecture, so I'll try to make this a brief. Craig Applegath is an architect and urban designer and an expert on resilience. He is a visionary and an expert in the planning and design of regenerative buildings, urban resilience, and symbiotic cities. He is founding principal 
Festival of Dialogues Toronto Studio, a multidisciplinary architecture, engineering, interior design, planning, and urban design services firm. He focuses on the well-being of communities and the larger environment they are a part of, addressing architecture's role in a much larger and more complex system. One such project is the Bill Fish Forest Stewardship Education Center, the first certified living building challenge project in Canada. A critical part of their work, Dialogue has developed a community well-being framework, a methodology available to design professionals to help them understand the impact of their work on the community well-being. Just as notable is Craig's service to the profession. He is the founder of ResilientCity.org, a not-for-profit network devoted to exploring planning and building design strategies to help cities develop the capacities to adjust to the impacts of climate change and energy scarcity. Additionally, he is the acting chair of the Mass Timber Institute, a member of the Canada Green Building Council, a founding board member of Sustainable Buildings Canada, a past president of the Ontario Association of Architects, and a fellow of the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada. Craig was trained as a biologist before pursuing an architecture degree at Dalhousie University. He earned a Master of Architecture in Urban Design from Harvard's Graduate School of Design, and he speaks widely on resilience, climate change, and energy scarcity. As a podcast fan, just want to let you know if you want to learn more from him after tonight, he is the host and producer of the 21st Century Imperative podcast. So you're in for a great talk tonight, so please allow me to introduce Craig Applegat. Welcome to Toronto. It's, it's a really miserable winter here right now. Usually it's snowing at this time, but uh, this thing called climate change, I think, is evidencing itself for you these few days. You know about me and Michelle. Thank you for that very generous introduction. Wow. I'm going to ask you to get a sense of who you are and what you care about. Who here, put up your hand, is worried about the future? All of you. Who is very worried about the future? Yeah. Who is hopeful and thinks that we'll be able to solve the significant climate change challenges we now face? Not as many. Maybe by the end of this presentation, I'll see some more hands. What do I think? Well, this presentation is about what I think. Two years ago, I found that I was lecturing to people around the world at various conferences for architects and planners and engineers, and they're all my age. They're all principals of firms because we can afford to go to conferences. So I decided instead of going to conferences to talk to old people like me, I think the new phrase is, OK, boomer, um, oh, yes, yes. Unfortunately, I'm one of those people. I decided to do a podcast called 21st Century Imperative to interview people that I thought were making a really, really key contribution to understanding what we could do to reduce harm, reduce greenhouse gas emissions and so forth, adapt to the impacts of the harm we were causing, climate change impacts, and then possibly regenerate and repair the damage we've done. So if you want to check some of those out, I don't talk a lot. I ask questions of my guests to talk about what they're doing, and they're, and they're very interesting. And, and tonight I'm going to present some of the ideas that I've learned from that, and then maybe give you some ideas about what you might do in your own practice. So, what is our current situation? I'm going to run through this really fast because I think you're all familiar with it, but I want to just give us a context for this presentation and remind you of what's going on. Clearly, um, there's increasing CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere right now. They're going up. They're not leveling out right now. They're continuing to rise. Right now, CO2 is at 408 parts per million. When I started giving presentations, about 10 years ago, it was 387, and that was high. Because for us not to have any impact from climate on the world's biosphere, we have to be at 350 parts per million or less. That's a long way to get back down to. 
There's also, and this is not so commonly understood, but you guys that are tuned in probably know about this, there's increasing CH4, methane concentrations in the atmosphere. And both these things, and methane, by the way, is 100 times more insulative or creating the climate change warming effect than CO2 is. So it's even more of an impact on climate change warming than CO2. Increasing global temperatures, obviously, is a result from this. And in 2016, it was hottest year on record. And every year since has been just as hot. So what are the impacts? Well, some of the impacts we're seeing around the world, depending on where it is, is increased wildfires in areas that are drying out because of climate change, because of precipitation decreasing. Or Toronto, uh, more uh, flash flood events because there's greater amounts of moisture in the atmosphere and greater precipitation. There's also more frequent and intense hurricanes. And the range of those hurricanes, witness Sandy, is increasing as well. More frequent tornadoes for those of you from the West. And a shifting polar vortex. So when you hear certain voices say something like, well, it's getting colder in the winter and snowier in the winter, so how could climate be warming up? Well, that's because the polar vortex, which is the wind that moves around the Arctic, is being shifted by the warming Arctic, and the cold Arctic winds are being deflected down through Canada into the United States. So more snow, more cold in the winters in the future. More frequent snowstorms as a result of that, and more frequent ice storms. Wow. It's scary and it's depressing, but there is good news. We have all the technology and all the knowledge we need to solve this problem. Right now, as Mark Jacobson, professor of civil engineering and environmental engineering at Stanford says, right now, we have about 95% of the technology we need. The bottom line is we just need to deploy it. Deploy, deploy, deploy. I think there's actually a chance we can do this. Here's why. We have all the tools we need to deal with the climate change causes. All the tools we need now. There's no excuse for us not to be able to do this. We've got everything we need. We've got PV, photovoltaics, that are below net parity. And what net parity means is the cost of producing electricity at the cost of burning coal. PV is now, in most places in Canada and United States, below net parity. Wind is the same. The electrification of cars and trucks around the world has started in earnest. We have all the technology to do that. It's just a question of production. We even have the electrification of air planes. It's in its infancy, but we're moving in that direction. And of course, you guys, we're all in the business of making buildings. And we have all the tools, all the techniques, all the things we need to power our buildings or make our buildings part of powering our cities. But you're probably asking, yeah, Craig, but what about the legacy of fossil fuel? All of these systems, all this lock-in, all these legacy systems that are still going on, what are we gonna do about those? What are we gonna do about gas-fired power generation? Gas is so much better than coal, but it's still kicking out CO2 emissions. What are we gonna do about cement production? It produces a lot of CO2 in the production, and steel production as well. Well, about three or four years ago, I was introduced to this fellow in the middle of the picture here, Professor Steve Martin, and he is an expert in nuclear physics and light. Oh, what's that got to do with algae? Well, he came up with the bright idea of sticking high-intensity LED lights in water and introducing pond scum, algae, 
and then pumping CO2 emissions through the tank. And guess what? Algae love CO2. Algae eat CO2. CO2 is their food. Light helps them digest CO2 and NOx and SOx as well. So this plant here, I was out for the opening of this plant in St. Mary's, the St. Mary's cement plant, by the way, and they were feeding in the CO2 emissions. Uh, they're feeding in the effluent from the uh, making of cement into this bioreactor. And those little boxes there, you white boxes, are the little controllers for each long tube of LED lights that go into this tank. And what this tank produces is this guck here. This green goo is algae, concentrated algae. OK, so we take this algae out of these tanks. Well, what that's done is it's taken the, the, the CO2 out of that cement emissions and it's turned it into algae. Guess what? You don't need subsidies to do this. Algae is very valuable. Algae can be used for many different things. Algae can be used for, for feedstocks, for animals. Algae can be used for making nutraceuticals and makeups and drugs. Algae also can be put back into a closed loop system and burned as a biofuel. Basically, we can take all the CO2 out of any sort of fossil fuel emissions. Remember, algae is what makes oil and coal. One of the things, when it died millions of years ago, hundreds of millions of years ago, was compressed, it turned into oil. So it's getting back its nutrients from its little forebearers. Anyway, so we have this now, and I was able to attend the sod turning for Pond, hooking up with a district energy association or a district energy company in Markham, Ontario, just north of here. And District energy is, as you know, what takes in natural gas or coal or whatever and turns it into heat and power to power a community. Well, now they can do that without producing any CO2. And they're taking that technology around the world. So this isn't commonly known. It's too bad. If, if you do nothing else, tell people about this, even though they go, what? No, that can't be. But look into it, because this is what's going to solve the legacy CO2 problem. OK. Second thing is, we've done this before. Not you and not me, but my parents' generation did this. Now, I don't know if you guys read history, but back in 1941, Britain was on its knees. The Battle of Britain had just happened. The Germans were probably going to win if they invaded Britain, most likely. And Churchill tried to convince President Roosevelt, the president at the time, to come into the war. But as you know, there's a certain segment of the United States that is right-leaning, right? And that same segment was against the United States joining the Allies in the Second World War. But Roosevelt knew that he had to help Britain in order to maintain democracy in the Western world. So what he did was created a program called Arsenal Democracy. And he called up the CEOs, the owners of the car plants in Detroit, and he said, how many tanks are you making right now? And they said, none. How many troop carriers are you making now? And they said, one or two. What about Jeeps and stuff? Well, a few. Good. Well, within a year, you're going to be making hundreds of thousands of tanks and Jeeps, and we're going to pay you to do it. So thousands upon thousands were rolling off the assembly lines, as were aircraft. The United States became the arsenal for the free world in defending itself against Nazi Germany. And this happened in two years. Two years. Think if these airplanes were making, instead of propellers to propel bombers, they were producing propellers for wind towers. And think about 
producing plants that would produce PV for deploying all over North America and Europe. It's estimated that 1% of the overall area of the United States would be required to power the United States using PV. Do you know what 1% is? It's the same area as all the roads in the USA. Well, they built the whole road system, the whole highway system, in the 50s and 60s in like a decade. We can do it. But, and it's a really big but, we only have 10 years to do it. That's up to you guys, right? 10 years. You've got 10 years, and all that licensure stuff you just heard about, it's all going to be for naught, unless we can do it in 10 years. <sighs> United Nations examined all the evidence and concluded in March last year that we had 11 years, which is now 10 years to go. Why? Because climate change is creating positive feedback loops. And unfortunately, the word positive isn't so positive here. It just means the more of the loop happens, the more and more and more it happens. So you see that white surface there? That's the Arctic. That's where the North Pole is in summer. Now, that area of ice floating at the top of the world is decreasing in size because of climate change, atmospheric warming, and ocean warming. And what that means is, as it decreases in size, more blue ocean appears, and blue ocean attracts and retains the heat from sun's rays, whereas it's white because it's bouncing light off of it. So as the ice melts, more heating happens in the ocean and the atmosphere, more ice melts, positive feedback loop. So that increases the actual warming of the planet. But here's the scary thing. This is, this is what absolutely scares the crap out of me. And that is Arctic tundra releasing methane, CH4. The Arctic tundra, and I spent a year as a co-op student up in Iqaluit, Frobisher Bay then. And ever, we had designed the buildings to sit on permafrost because that meant the ground was permanently frozen all year round. Well, it's not anymore. The permafrost is melting. And what is the permafrost? It's one giant, big, gooey swamp. And what's in swamps? It's bacteria producing methane. So as the permafrost melts and as the tundra melts, it releases methane. And methane is 100 times more insulative, as I said, than CO2. Feedback loop, positive feedback loop that's very negative. Again, we have all the tools we need to deal with the things that are producing greenhouse gases. We've got the technology, we just have to deploy it. We've done it before. If we have the will, if we can convince our politicians, and by the way, that's one of your jobs, is to convince your politicians that this is important. But we only have 10 years, at most, maybe less. So good news, bad news, but I think good news. At least we can do it. It's not hopeless. So how can you contribute? What can you do? You're not politicians. You can't call up Ford or GM and tell them to start producing all this stuff. What, what can you do? So let's go back to the 21st century imperative. And the 21st century imperative is basically that this is what we've got to do in the 21st century. And by the way, we've got to do it the first 10 years of the 20, 21st century. We've got to reduce the harm. And we've got to, at the same time, figure out how to adapt to the harm we've already caused the planet because it's starting to bite. And then, maybe after we've done that 10 years of stopping the damage we're causing, is repair and regenerate. That's what you guys should think about doing in how you design buildings, how you plan buildings, how you act as an architect in the world. So I think there are seven key things 
you can do as an architect to meet the challenges of the 21st century imperative. And I've called this the architect's new deal because I think it's easier to remember an acronym than seven things. So each one of these letters stands for one of the words that I'm going to talk about. N is for natural systems. Natural systems, what am I talking about? Well, when I was in your shoes, climate was not even being talked about. Climate was just something that you were in. Your buildings were always going to be in the same climate, as far as we knew, forever. It was a given. It was a normal. There was winter and the summer and spring and fall, but the climate that existed in was constant. It's changing. And as a result, the buildings that you design in that system have to respond to that change. But climate change is also changing ecology. For example, the zones for plants is changing. It's actually changed about a half a zone in the last 10 years. That means that things you would have planted and worked with your landscape architects on collaboratively are going to be different. Like, how do you plan for 10 years from now when things are going to be warmer or drier or wetter? That's not something we thought about. You have to think about it. Climate changing as well as ecology changing. And all the impacts that your buildings are going to have to deal with. And geography. Geography is constant. Well, maybe not if there are floods that erode things and the geography will impact what you can do with those new plant species that you may be wanting to plant. So start to think about natural systems being something in flux and changing and your buildings are going to have to respond to them. Energy systems. Okay, you guys probably have heard lots and lots about energy systems and how to reduce energy. We can't efficiency eyes our way to zero carbon. What we can do though is we can plan our buildings to be zero carbon buildings and plan the systems that we incorporate into those buildings to accomplish that. So this is one of my favorite dialogue buildings. I, I didn't design it. One of my partners did. But this is a, a library in Calgary. We were tasked, as we're tasked with actually most of our projects now in the institutional world, with having a zero carbon building. So this building had to produce all of its own energy. And one of the ways it did that, you can see the solar array on the roof, right? But you can also see those black panels in the facade. And those are PV that have been elegantly integrated to make a really lovely composition. So I think there's opportunity here to actually make beautiful buildings. Like architects, you didn't go into this to save the world. You went in to make beautiful buildings, right? Hands up, who went in to make beautiful buildings? Right? Yeah, right? That's why I went into it. But now we have to make beautiful buildings that also incorporate zero carbon energy systems, integrated PV. There's various ways that you can integrate PV into your buildings, start to become familiar with them. This is one by Morgan Solar here in Toronto that we're collaborating with. This is a tracking system in a double facade. It tracks the sun, very highly efficient, although there, you can see the translucent panels allows light through, cool. This is really neat, another Morgan Solar thing. And by the way, I, I'm not getting paid by Morgan Solar. I just think they're doing really cool shit. Um, <laughs> but integrated PV into the Venetian blinds. Those little strips there, the Venetian blinds reflect the light. There's a little sort of parabolic shape there into the center of the blind and it collects light. So you can actually do that in existing buildings. And this. So all of the mechanical engineers you deal with and collaborate with probably now are going to say, well, we're going to put in gas boilers. And No. In future, May may do it now. The client may make you do it now. But make damn sure that your buildings have the electrical capacity to power electric boilers for heat and heat pumps for cool and heat and moving heat around your buildings because in some places your building is going to be warm take the heat from there right and put it where it's cold and in some places it will be cooler you can move it around as well as ground source and then power over ethernet you guys have experienced this yet anyone using this no so the little ethernet cables that just you know, plugged into your computer network, they'll be carrying power as well in the future. 
to power lights, security systems. Everything's going to be connected. And power, because most of the building power we have here could all be running on 12 or 24 volts and running over these lines. So having that as a tool would be very important for you to understand. Wood. Oh, it's such a wonderful material to work with. This is a, a, an image of our sub, Student Union Building in um, UBC, University of British Columbia. And wood is so lovely because our biophilic needs, our instincts to be in the natural world are to a certain extent fulfilled by being in wood buildings. And the other really interesting thing, an important thing about wood is it sequesters carbon. One cubic meter, that's like one cubic yard in American, of wood is equal to one metric ton of CO2 sequestered. So think about that. Why is that important? Because if we can create a supply line to make mass timber buildings that use cross-laminated timber and glue lamp posts and beams and parallel strand lumber and so forth, if we can do that, then what we're going to do is suck the carbon out of sustainably harvested forests, not clear-cut forests, sustainably harvested, make sure it's sustainable or this is pointless, and put it into buildings. And the reason you want to store it in buildings is because then you can get a supply chain and planting of more trees and the sustainable management of forests that will help bring the, the CO2 content down of the atmosphere. And building with mass timber makes for absolutely gorgeous buildings. This is a building I'm working on right now. This is a, I'm, I'm very proud of because it was so much fun to collaborate with the team doing. And what makes it so wonderful is the lovely wood. We had to design a 9 hertz instead of 6 hertz, and it makes for these huge columns and beams that are just so like being in the ship. Density. Okay, a lot of people have this misconception that cities produce so much CO2 and they're dirty. And if you look at the total amount of CO2 coming out of cities, it's way more than the surrounding countryside. But that's not the point. The point is that cities consume one-third the energy per capita, per person, that is, of the suburbs, even less than the surrounding region. Here's a, a good um, GIS map. This is Greater Toronto Area here on this map. And you probably can't read the little uh, legend there, but the orange is very, very high emissions of carbon per capita. It's like 10 to 13 tons per person. Whereas the, the dark green is three to four tons. Look where the dark green is. You're right down in the dark green right now, where we are right here. Well, it stands to reason, doesn't it? Down here, there's smaller houses, smaller apartments. You can walk to work. You can walk to the store. You don't have to drive a car to get milk. You don't have to drive to school. You walk to school. You don't have to expend as much CO2 to live. So cities are very, very important because of their density. So keep that in mind. Density is good. So the next question is, how do we make good density? And there's a real debate going on around the world about how to make good density. Someone once quipped that it's not how dense you make it, it's how you make it dense. And I think that's worth keeping in mind. I think one of the better strategies for taller buildings for density is the Vancouver Tower platform strategy. So a platform of three or four stories that greet the street in a way that makes for a humane streetscape if done well, and then the towers float up behind. The other strategy is a medieval European strategy, which is five to eight stories, blocks of apartments and buildings. Actually, this is the kind of city I'd like to live in if I had a choice. Both are very dense, but they allow us to have very low carbon per capita density. 
really key. Equity. Equity. What the heck does equity have to do with you guys reducing CO2 emissions and saving the world? Well, designing for inclusion and diversity, which is, I think, what equity is about for us as designers, I think has to do with what the president of the AIA was talking about earlier, which is about getting different voices to the table, getting a diverse set of voices, getting a diverse set of gender and ethnic voices, income voices to the table, because we need all hands on deck to solve the problems we have, and we need different ideas, not the same ideas from the same group, and we need everyone to buy into what we need to do. So the independent, which is a, a sort of rightish of center, web-based English paper, had an article that quoted McKinsey and Company. And McKinsey and Company examined over 1,000 companies across 12 countries and found that firms in the top quartile for gender diversity are 21% more likely to enjoy above average profitability than companies at the bottom. So that's interesting. Gender diversity will, if you have women and men together at the table, will improve your chances of success. And they also found that companies in the top quartile for ethnic diversity, meanwhile, are 33% more likely to see higher than average profits than companies in the lowest quartile. Profits is a stand-in for effectiveness. You don't make money, you don't make profit as a company if you're ineffective. So I think what we, this says to us is that equity is going to be very important. And what does it mean for us? I think it means inclusion and diversity in our design process is important in terms of how we design for buildings. So our buildings are the vessels of our culture, and those buildings are going to have to support the ability for diverse voices and diverse cultures. And form, I think what we like to do, make beautiful buildings, that that beauty, that those compositions, that what we design is going to have to have an appropriate cultural expression that's meaningful and engages all of the people in the community. Adaptation. Well, climate change is starting to bite. This is a, a picture of the Morgan Chase building after Hurricane Ike in 2009. Look at all the windows punched out by the storm. Think about more and more hurricanes happening with greater and greater force and more and more cities. So this is what you're going to have to be designing for. Now, there's all sorts of ways to do it, sort of all sorts of ways to protect your buildings. For example, this is a prototype that we uh, were designing in the Toronto studio that also did more than just protect the building from being punctured by flying debris in a hurricane. It provided these screens that you could grow green stuff on, green vines, and plants, and so forth. So that would actually help cool the building. And also, it's biophilic, like human beings like this stuff. It's good. So it's a screen, it's biophilic, cools the building. That's one approach. I think. We have to look at adaptation not just from a protective point of view. Resilience is not just or is not only about protecting our cities and our buildings. It's also about adapting to the realities of a constantly being hit by the impacts of climate change. So I'm going to use this Parisian street here. And one of the reasons I really like the lower rise densification is because what it means for operational Resilience. This is the real key in resilience. It's not protection, because once you go beyond the protective ability, whatever you're instituting for protection, it's no longer effective. But adapting to the operation so that when something goes wrong, your building can adapt to it, that's important resilience. So this little diagram here shows what you can do with a, up to a 10-story building. Up to a 10-story building, the water mains, the pressure of the water mains, can actually drive water up to the top floor. After that, you need pumps. In some cities, it will vary, right? Some cities, that pressure won't be enough. So you know, look at what your cities allow for. 
What that means is that at some point, the power's going to get knocked out in cities. Generation will go, station will go down, cables will be blown over, whatever, and the power's going to go out. In a 20-story building, what are you going to do? You can't walk up and down 20 stories to get milk. And especially if you've got any sort of impairment or over the age where you don't want to walk up and down 20 stories like me, you can walk up and down 10 stories. That's why they built these buildings. They didn't have elevators when these buildings were built. People would walk up and down. The people with less money lived on the top and the people with more money lived on the bottom. But nevertheless, you could walk up and down. So the other thing is, 10 stories is the maximum height at which trees, large trees, can cool the building. So you've got shading and cooling and water and access when things get bad. That's important. You can't do that with the, the tower and the platform strategy. So think about that when you're thinking about resilience in the future. Okay, and the seventh and final thing you need to do is this landscape, how you imagine the landscape. But first, this is worth thinking about. The one question I bet you're all asking yourselves right now, what about the CO2 already in the atmosphere, Craig? How are we going to deal with that? Is that what you're asking? Yes, yes of course you are. How will it get back down to 350 parts per million that you said was sustainable? Well, that's the question that has been bothering me for the last two years. Until I read this book, The Ends of the World. When I tell people I'm reading The Ends of the World and it's a great book, and the author really has a sense of humor. They go, are you serious? What the ends of the world is about, it's about all of the mass extinctions in the geological record of time. How they happened, what caused them, and what lessons we can learn from those extinctions. Well, when I went into it, I sort of thought, well, it's going to be about how we pull back from carbon, but it, because I knew that most extinctions had to do with volcanoes barfing a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere and that doing what it's doing right now. That's true, but there's more than that. So this is a chart that shows the causes of the major one, two, three, four, five extinctions, mass extinctions in the geological historical record. So the last three, the Permian and the KT, are all caused by huge volcanic eruptions, like eruptions so large in the Permian that all of New York State was covered in like a mile thick of lava. And that emission of CO2 caused global warming and acidification of the ocean. Sound familiar? And one thing led to another, read the book, and there was mass extinction. But if you look at what happened in the Devonian, and I'm going to zoom in here, what caused the mass extinction here? Rapid global cooling. Do you know what happened in the Devonian epoch? It's when trees evolved from the goo that was in the oceans that crawled out migrated on land, grew roots, this is over like hundreds of millions of years, and became trees. Up until that point, all of the land masses around the world were barren. There was no life on them, except in the water, the lakes and so forth. Otherwise, the land was just rock. There was nothing there. And then the trees started to evolve, and with seeds blowing inland, more trees, and trees create their own weather, and more trees, until trees covered the globe. And you know what they did? They sucked so much CO2 out of the atmosphere that they caused like three or four miles of ice to form all around the world that caused this extinction. 
So, hmm, are you thinking what I'm thinking? I read this and I went, holy shit, this is phenomenal. This is such good news. Wow, plant trees. <laughs> right? So if there's two things you take away from this, it's figure out how to get algae to suck up the CO2 out of all the fossil fuel. And the second is plant trees. Your responsibilities, make sure your buildings have lots of trees around them. As I was reading this book, this article came out on the internet. The Crowther Lab, inspired by nature, driven by science, published an article in Science Magazine. And the Science Magazine is the organ of the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And what the journal article said was, there is enough room. He measured, he got all his graduate students to measure through GIS imaging around the world. There was enough room in the world's existing parks, forests, and abandoned land to plant 1.2 trillion additional trees. That's not on farms, that's not in cities, that's not on roads, that's not in anywhere that we occupy as humans and need. And that doesn't count all the all of the farm grazing land that could have trees planted on them and still have animals grazing on them. Which would have the CO2 storage capacity to cancel out a decade of carbon dioxide emissions. Oh, that's cool. So, we have to do two things. We have to gear up our economy to produce all the PV and wind and renewable energy required to power the world, and then it's also plant trees to suck the existing carbon out of the atmosphere. By the way, that's why mass timber is so freaking important, because what we want is a healthy, sustainable forest industry that plants trees, cuts trees sustainably so it doesn't allow the carbon to come out of the forest floor, and that's a long story. But nevertheless, sustainably harvested in the buildings, we want that cycle to occur so there's an economy to do that, and there's a reason to do that. Plant lots of trees. And that means looking at your building sites, even in little courtyards where there's no space, figure it out, plant some trees. I mean, it may just be one, but every single one counts. Remember, one tree is about a couple of cubic meters of wood, so a couple of tons of CO2. And then ecologically integrated urban design. I mean, a lot of you architects are going to be involved in urban design as well as building design, and I think you have to start thinking about the streets. This is what typical little small town Ontario looks like, which we were helping to do a master plan, and this is what we said they should be thinking about. So not only the trees make the whole neighborhood much nicer, and therefore, the retailer's happy because people are going to walk and shop and stuff. Suck up carbon. So that's your new deal. Natural systems, energy systems, wood, density, equity, adaptation, and plant trees. Am I optimistic that we're going to be able to do this? When I was your age, when I was just an intern architect, 1989. I graduated from grad school in 1987, just starting my career, just like you. And something happened which was shocking to me. The Berlin Wall came down, was taken down. Not the fact that the wall came down was so important, but the fact that in my mind, and a lot of people in North America's mind, Soviet Union was going to be there forever. It was a weird, fucked up place, but it was still there. They had nuclear weapons. They had command and control of their society. People that disagreed got sent to the Gulag Archipelago. Wow. And all of a sudden, it just came tumbling down. So just because something looks like it's impossible to change 
doesn't mean it is. The paradigm we live in is just a paradigm. It can change, and it can change very quickly, and it can change because of people like you going out and making it change, being Greta Thunberg, being change. So at the very same time that this was happening, actually about a year later, this man who had been imprisoned by the communists in Czechoslovakia because he was an activist, he wrote some articles and did a couple of plays that were slightly critical of the existing government, so they put him in jail a number of times. It didn't seem to bother me, he wrote his plays while he was in jail, as it turned out. But he was a very colorful and very intellectually able president with a sense of humor. And he was once asked when he was first elected and being interviewed by reporters, he was asked by one reporter, are you optimistic about the future? Here's what he said. He said, no, I'm not an optimist in the sense that I believe everything will go well. But neither am I a pessimist in the sense that I believe everything will go wrong. I am hopeful, for without hope, there will be no progress. Hope is as important as life itself. So I have one request from you. What I want you to do is I want you to pull out your iPhones or your Androids or whatever you got, and I want you to turn them on. Okay? Get them out. Because I'm going to have you do something on them right now. I want you to do a repeating appointment with yourself on the first day of every month. And I want you to remind yourself, what am I doing this month to meet the challenges of the 21st century imperative? Just ask yourself, every month, what are you doing? You're doing your end carb and you're trying to make a living and you're trying to do cool design. Yes, but what are you also doing to meet this challenge? And if you want to tune in to hear what some other people around the world are doing that I think is really cool and practical, inspiring ideas, check out the podcast. So thank you very much for your time. It was a real pleasure. links to more information about this podcast and to notes about the books and references we've discussed at tfcipodcast.com. And if you like the podcast, please let us know by rating it on the Apple iTunes podcast website and by sponsoring the podcast on our Patreon sponsor page at patreon.com forward slash tfci podcast. This podcast is ad free and relies entirely on listener support from people like you. So, If you find our podcast interesting and valuable, please consider becoming a patron. Your sponsorship will not only help us cover the cost of production, but we will also be spending 50 cents of every sponsorship dollar to plant trees. To do this, we have formed a partnership with Community Forest International, who will not only be planting seedlings for you, but taking care of them to make sure they continue to grow and absorb carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So please head over to the Patreon page and become a sponsor. Until next time, thanks for listening. Thank you.